one too many, on Nickland's numbering practices. By Vincent Le. After a long period mostly devoted to the interpretation and deconstruction of texts, continental philosophy is presently seeing a rise in new realisms and materialisms which seek to rid philosophy of its anthropocentrism in favor of new and strange voyages in a vaster, inhuman cosmos. This speculative turn has also seen renewed interest in forgotten and neglected thinkers, foremost among whom is nomadic philosopher Nick Land. The underlying goal of all of Land's writings is to critique the anthropomorphization of reality by confronting us with the brute fact of our species' inexorable extinction, beyond which our thinking cannot extend. In Land's own decisive words, that humanity is fated to terminate is amongst the most basic thoughts, and no more than the most elementary qualification for philosophy, since to think on behalf of one's species is a miserable parochialism. More precisely, Land looks to capitalism's technological advancement as a way to do anthropomorphize thought insofar as he sees it as eventually giving rise to an artificial superintelligence at the advent of a technological singularity, which would be incomprehensible and even life threatening to humanity. It might still be a few decades before artificial intelligences surpass the horizon of biological ones, but it is utterly superstitious to imagine that the human dominion of terrestrial culture is still marked out in centuries, let alone in some metaphysical perpetuity. The high road to thinking no longer passes through a deepening of human cognition, but rather through a becoming inhuman of cognition. A migration of cognition out into the emerging planetary technosentience reservoir, into dehumanized landscapes, emptied spaces where human culture will be dissolved. For land, it is ultimately the creation of strong artificial intelligence, AI, through the dynamics of industrial capitalist competition that marks the ultimate subversion of humanity's pretensions to fully come to know reality through our concepts of reason since this AI marks a limit concept beyond which we cannot survive, let alone understand. Given Land's virulent critique of human hubris, it is unsurprising that, while a lecturer at Warwick University in the 1990s, Land taught he and Hamilton Grant and Ray Brassier, two of the four founding members of the speculative realist movement, who also explore death, nature and other inhuman realities. Land has also gone on to influence a younger generation of political theorists such as Nick Svnasek and Alex Williams, whose own left accelerationist project aims to appropriate and repurpose techno-capitalist processes and dynamics to fulfill the quest of Homo sapiens towards expansion beyond the limitations of the Earth and our immediate bodily forms. Despite Land's influence on speculative realism, accelerationism and other strands of contemporary continental philosophy, there have not been any sustained studies of his own thought outside a few conference talks, blog posts and short general introductions. Instead, most engagements with Land tend to appropriate his concepts and apply them to other fields and areas of research with minimal regard for how Land himself first developed and used such concepts. In particular, there has been little scholarly engagement with the most obscure, yet also crucial part of Land's work, the various numbering practices that he developed between the mid-90s and the early noughties. Therein lies this paper's contribution, it traces the way that Land's numbering practices, from Kabbalism and occult numerology, to mathematics and machinic code, seek to open up language to capitalist modernity's increasing technological entanglement beyond human comprehension. To do this, I will classify these numbering practices into five overlapping, yet distinct branches, hypervirus, mechanomics, Kabbalism, tics notation, and quinomics. As I proceed, I will also contextualize each practice within the intellectual traditions it presupposes, but which Land seldom discusses in any significant detail. I begin by examining Land's first attempt to hack into our linguistic systems by overriding them with machinic code and binary symbolism in a way that mirrors modernity's often confounding technological advancement. I then consider his appropriation of Georg Cantor's set theory and Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem to plot across the number line ever greater degrees of reality's incongruous access to anthropic order and logic. 
In the third section, I turn to Land's esoteric use of Kabbalistic numerology as another occult way to decode human language and uncover the contingency of many of our beliefs, truths and values. The fourth section considers Land's radicalization of Kabbalism through the development of his own particularly abstract and impersonal notational geometria. This paper ultimately concludes by looking at Land's interest in the computer keyboard's lock into the QWERTY layout for proffering a glimpse of modern technology's increasingly dehumanizing meltdown of our delusions of grandeur. Through this unholy alchemic cocktail of science and the occult, this paper hopes to demonstrate how Land's numbering practices strip language of our meanings and significations in such a way as to stage an encounter with an inhuman outside. 1. Eckrich Virulenty. Land first seeks to formally stage modernity's technological subversion of the traditional sense of self through his compositional prose style in a 1995 essay called Hypervirus. After starting out the essay by describing how the cybernetics of modernity scrambles our supposedly universal truths and values, the subsequent paragraph is comprised entirely of binary code that formally performs the very confusion which modernity unleashes upon our sense and signification. In this way, Land argues that modernity is a computer virus which replicates itself by infecting its rational hosts to the point of scrambling and ultimately expelling all discursive meaning. To cite the passage at length, as culture migrates into partial machines, Lacking an autonomous reproductive system, semiotics subsides into virotechnics. 00101010110111100 Yes no yes no yes yes no longer what does it mean? But how does it spread? A conversion of the binary code to text in the above passage reveals that it does not actually signify anything, which might suggest that land has descended into pure postmodern meaninglessness. However, it is my contention that this is exactly Land's intention. The meaningless, or what he terms, following Deleuze and Guattari, a signifying code, represents increasingly autonomous techniques' pursuit of their own self replication without any interest in serving human use value. It is modern technological systems' decoding of human identity and reason that Land seeks to formally capture in Hypervirus by constantly cutting up his writing with jarring codifications, a signifying symbols, and repeated words which glitch in loops like a broken record player. The essay's end thus captures the limits of our understanding and perhaps even existence through a particularly cybersec scrambling of anthropic lexicography through symbols that represent precisely nothing, zero, or the empty set, mindlessly self-replicating, revolution, molting, leaves, nothing intact tact tact. Cybersec repleting slippage into dark side, distributive rom scrambling tact tactics. Zero program, seven therein lies the signifying numbering practice that Land first announces in Hypervirus before exploring it elsewhere. The abstraction of language into ever more incoherent and senseless planes of meaningless machinic intensity. As we shall see in the next section, it is Land's attempt to dehumanize his compositional prose style that would lead him to take an intense interest in mathematics as the field of thought most abstracted from lived experience. 2. The number in itself land more rigorously develops his decoding of linguistic systems in the 1998 essay Mechanomics. He begins by chastising mathematics as statist and despotic in the deluso guatarian sense that it abstracts, organizes and formalizes the multiplicity of particular, sensible things in terms of fixed and general forms, which are axiomatically derivable from human reason, state culture however modern or even postmodern, is modeled upon an ideal despotic voice, logos. The word from on high drafts the signifying chain. 8 Clearly, Land's view of mathematics is that it is a Platonism that idealistically conflates thoughts models of real phenomena with the things themselves. At the same time, Land qualifies that he is not seeking to dismiss all numbering practices tout caught as subject to the same mathematical idealism, but rather distinguish the latter from what he terms numeracy. 
a use of numbers that reveals them to be irreducible to the logos inasmuch as they speak to an excessive nomadism always on the run from the all-encompassing despotism of reason. Numerical calculation mobilizes a thinking that is directly and effectively exterior, indexing the machinic dispersion or an organic distribution of the number. No sooner in the head than on fingers and pebbles, counting always happens on the outside. Nine land distinguishes between numeracy and mathematics with reference to Deleuze and Guattari's distinction in a thousand plateaus between the ecumenon and the planomenon. Whereas the ecumenon, which traditionally denotes the promotion of unity around the church, is an abstract machine that assembles its multiplicity of parts in a stratified way around an authorial point in what can only amount to a relative deterritorialization of order and reason, the planomenon is an abstract machine assembling its parts in such a way as to facilitate the free flow of their heterogeneous intensities through an absolute deterritorialization. More precisely, Deleuze and Guattari explain that the ecumenon stratifies through a two-fold process of expression which marks the molar organization of a thing's many parts into one overarching unity, and content which denotes the molecular stratification of a multiplicity into a larger unity, between the two, the difference is first of the order of grandeur or scale. Drawing upon this distinction, Land explains that the ecumenon denotes the logo's way of ordering a multiplicity of numbers around a fixed and abstract principle of reason, which determines their order, stability and self-identity in two ways. On the one hand, expression orders numbers according to lower numerical types, such as by showing how the multiplicity of numbers can be derived as multiplications of the unity of the first number one. Expression deals with relatively deproblematized elements of a lower numerical type, exhibits a higher degree of consolidated cardinality, and operates a selection of comparatively tractable instances. On the other hand, content deals with more complex and higher order numbers by grouping them into unified sets, or counting them according to probabilistic laws. Content deals with elements of greater typal generality and numerical complexity for which it requires a relatively heterogeneous semiotic, involving varieties of algebraic, indexic, probabilistic, and anexact components. Through this twofold stratification of the upper limit of the set and the lower limit of the one, the ecumenon coheres all numbers into a well-ordered sequence which displaces the chaos of inconsistent multiplicity that numbers threaten to let loose. What clearly bothers Land about the ecumenon's expression and content is that it seeks to synthesize a chaotic multiplicity through the mediation of transcendental unities and sets in a way which is all too similar to anthropocentric reason's internalization of the outside as its own self-posited limit concept. While the ecumenon appears to be an essentially numerical operation, Land argues that the true essence of the number in itself remains exterior to its computational clutches, the number in itself is exterior to the ecumenon, even when seized by it. This number in itself is what Land calls, after Deleuze and Guattari, the planomenon or plane of consistency, an inconsistent multiplicity that threatens to dissolve all sequenced number lines insofar as it is always in excess of even their highest quilting point. They are assembled diagrammatically, from directly expressive traits distributed differentially in a flat space of O-dimensionality, nomos, and comprise a non-redundant order of differences, unsequenced sequence. At first glance, Land seems to be making the claim that the difference between the planomenon and the ecumenon is numerically reflected in the distinction between cardinality meaning numbers as quantities, for example 18 rats. 13 wolves, etc., and ordinality meaning the position of things in a sequence, the fourth fastest wolf, the ninth slowest rat. However, Land rejects this reading of cardinality as being conjoined to the planomenon on the grounds that it can just as well repress numeracy as liberate it. For example, even quantities of very large cardinality can still be unified into sets with common properties and extensive principles of classification. It is precisely the calculary indefiniteness of highly general numbers that leads most directly to the suppression of numerical autonomy, 
by encouraging the subordinations of concrete numeracy to superior dimensions that logicize or geometrize it. Conversely, it is ordinality that provides an effective anti-language by carving up the number line into zones and sequences with limit points beyond which lies ever more excessive multiplicities, far from denumerizing the alphabet, progressive decardinalization reinforces the numeric function, lexicographic ordinality effectuates an actual non-language and potential anti-language, it consists of ordinal indices, zontags that affect zonings and desnings, intershufflings, groupings, insertions, and extractions, operated according to concrete rules for non-metric cuttings, and characterized by rigorous and exactitude. Numeracy's lexicographic ordinality, according to which each sequence in the number line marks a rupture with what came before it, is thus distinct from mathematics cardinal stratification of higher number types into sets and lower magnitudes into replications of the unity of the one. What Land's numeracy ultimately proposes is a form of ordinality called mechanomics that uses the number line as a way to trace ever greater degrees of an inhuman reality's chaotic heterogeneity from its orderly sequencing and cardinal unification through two basic operations. On the one hand, factorization shows how the unity of any number can be broken down into a multiplicity of smaller numbers that are combined to produce the initial larger number. On the other hand, priming, according to which every number greater than one is a product of primes or itself a prime, can be used to generate a multiplicity of numbers that produce the initially unified number in question. Through primes and factors, Land mirrors mathematics twofold process of expression and content, but in order to generate heterogeneous multiplicities rather than isomorphic unities, such ordinal desnings and resonings upon the natural number series occur each time a compositional number disaggregates into singular parts, affecting codings and decodings as surplus value, or a prime transfers itself to the ordinality that itemizes it into the potential factor of another number. On Land's reading, factorization and primes provide two operations for numeracy to open up ecumenic stratification onto the planomenon. Land sees another model for numeracy in renowned mathematician Kurt Gödel's famous incompleteness theorem. Given that Land's essay presupposes a familiarity with Gödel, I will briefly digress to outline the famed mathematician's chief achievement. Gödel begins his 1930 paper on formally undecidable propositions of Principia Mathematica and related systems by noting that mathematics throughout the first half of the 20th century has largely tried to formalize the entire field by finding the general rules and axioms from whence all operations and propositions could be derived. Whereas Gottlob Frege, David Hilbert and the other great mathematicians and logicians thought they could find an absolute system from whence all consistent theorems could be deduced, Gödel's first of two incompleteness theorems showed that every consistent system necessarily contains arithmetical propositions that are neither provable nor disprovable within that system, in both the systems mentioned there are in fact relatively simple problems in the theory of ordinary whole numbers which cannot be decided from the axioms. Proposition Vi thus states that, if a formal system P satisfies certain conditions of consistency, there is at least one recursive class sign R that is neither provable nor disprovable within P. Gödel's second incompleteness theorem states that any consistent system is itself inconsistent in that the statement the system is consistent is paradoxically unprovable within the system itself. As Proposition 11 puts it, the formula expressing the consistency of a system P cannot be established by a proof within P. In short, what Gödel unearthed is the impossibility of developing a complete system of all possible propositions given that we can always locate propositions which are not derivable from the system itself, including even the fact of the system's consistency. On Land's reading, Gödel showed that there is always an excess to every ecumenic system, which thereby regionalizes the system as one partial actualization of a larger and profoundly inconsistent numerical continuum. The cultural initiation of Gödel coding potential produces an instantaneous planomic mutation slanted towards nomadic multiplicities, virtually enveloping ecumenic segmentarity into a side process of flat numerical systems. 
In terms of numbers, Gödel's inconsistent propositions speak to how the number in itself exceeds any attempt to fully synthesize it into a cardinal manifold insofar as a residual of exteriority always remains. Numbers exceed the synthetic a priori, because, as Gödel demonstrates, all logical systems are quasi-arbitrary subsections of arithmetical pattern. For land, Gödelization is nothing less than the decoding of ecumenic mathematical idealism by way of a planomic incursion from the outside's machinic delirium. Land finds another even earlier model for numerical decoding in Georg Cantor's set theory, to the extent that it shows that every cardinal set is dwarfed by an even larger set, and so on literally ad infinitum. Here, as with Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Land assumes that the reader is already familiar with set theory. It is again worthwhile, then, for this paper to briefly sketch the rudiments of Cantor's discovery. In his 1883 paper Foundations of a General Theory of Manifolds, Cantor proposes an extension of real whole numbers beyond the infinite in contradistinction to common misconceptions regarding the infinite. Cantor calls the non-genuine infinite the mathematical orthodox view of the infinite as a diminishing towards an arbitrary and ill-defined smallness or grandeur. In its place, Cantor proffers a genuine infinite by demonstrating that the first class of finite whole numbers on a number line can be extended at once infinitely and rigorously. According to Cantorian set theory, a set is a collection or manifold m of elements m under some law. Each set thus has a cardinality power or number which permits us to compare and rank them in orders of magnitude. Traditionally, the highest cardinal is considered to be the set of all finite whole numbers 1, 2, 3, v. What Cantor realized, however, is that since every number in a number line has a higher subsequent and lower preceding number, the set of whole finite numbers if it is to be well defined can be no exception. Indeed, the set of whole finite numbers is clearly not a member of itself, thereby leaving out one number from its grasp. We can thus simply take this set and add one more number to it to achieve a higher set that includes the set of whole finite numbers. Given that the second number class is larger than the first class of all finite numbers, Cantor calls it the first infinite set or RLF0, 0. zero. Although the set is infinite, it is well ordered and mathematically rigorous in that it is assigned a real number in the number line, one ordinal position further than the set of real whole numbers. Now, since every well defined set in the number line has a higher subsequent number, even the infinite set can be grouped as an element in a larger set 0 by counting one more down the number line. This larger set can in turn be grouped into an even larger infinite set 1 and so on ad infinitum in a chain of ever larger infinite sets that take the highest number of the previous set and add at least one more number to it, 0, 1, 2. In this way, we can compare well-ordered infinite sets of paradoxically different magnitudes without ever reaching an ultimate end point to the number line. It is not therefore any particular infinite set, but the infinite series of infinite sets of different magnitudes that Cantor identifies with the absolute as it recedes even from ever larger, yet determinate infinities. The absolutely infinite number sequence therefore appears to me in a certain sense as an appropriate symbol of the absolute, whereas the infinity of the first number class, seems to me in comparison like an entirely insignificant nothing, not in the least, because I regard it as a comprehensible idea. By showing how every set of all sets does not include itself in the set and so requires a larger set to grasp it, Cantor expanded mathematics so that it could think the infinite as a well-defined concept. For Cantor as for land, set theory shows how we can take any well-ordered number line and proceed further down the continuum to decode its own delimited boundary number. Set theory thus eliminates the ecumenon's use of higher, complex numbers to unify quantities into consistent sets insofar as it shows that even larger numbers not belonging to those consistent sets can always be rigorously ranked and defined. In this way, Cantor's diagonal method formalizes the crossing from the ecumenic totalization of numbers to their planomenic excess, diagonal methods activate an inexhaustible innovative potential. 
it exploits capabilities no greater than those presupposed by a prospective completion, which it then subverts, by finding an extraneous item relative to any list, even an infinite one. For land, RLF0 marks the excess of the real beyond the logo's idealistic pretensions to cohere the number line into its own categorial grasp. Even RLF0 is not the number of highest magnitude, since we can generate further infinite sets of even greater magnitude. Ultimately, set theory does not even unveil the real as an infinite set beyond all finite stratification but as the infinite process of decoding and deterritorializing any and all stratifications. In this way, set theory makes ecumenic cardinality a testament to its own planomenic scrambling, cantor slides across schizophrenia, nomos non-zone, outside its planomic now, and the numbers are swarming, RLFO vaporizes on the plane of consistency. Both set theory and godalization mark nothing less than an alien incursion into our numerical practices by means of which we might just be able to glimpse, if only apophatically, the infinite vastness of the world without us. 3. Computer Cabalism At the turn of the century, Land took his mechanomics in an occult, esoteric direction of decoding meaning and language onto ever more abstract planes of intensity. Unlike orthodox Kabbalism, however, Land contended that he was not uncovering a hidden absolute truth, but rather the contingency of all truths as they are decoded without exception. Since Land does not explain in any detail the Kabbalistic traditions upon which he is drawing any more than he did Cantor's set theory or Gödel's incompleteness theorem, I begin this section by contextualizing Land's creative use of Kabbalistic numbering practices. The Kabbalah emerged in the 12th century and became popular in the 16th century as a mystical and esoteric hermeneutics of Torah commentary. According to Judaic Kabbalism, reality is divided into a tree of life that branches off into ten different realms or separate between the divine kingdom and our own physical world. The aim of Kabbalism is to become one with the divine by losing our individuated ego and transcending the finitude of our flesh. One of the ways Kabbalism proposes to channel the beyond is by showing how letters can be assigned numbers. In this way, we can discover the meaning of any unknown symbolism in the sacred texts by converting them into a numbering sequence, which can then be compared with other words possessing the same numbering sequences to find esoteric meanings in the sacred texts and scriptures. In the most basic numbering schema or geometria, for instance, we assign the number 1 to the letter A, 2 to B, 3 to C, and so on, as well as 100 to A, 101 to B, 102 to C, and so on for the numbers of higher magnitudes. According to this geometria, adding up the six letters of, say, the name Hitler equals 666, H equals 107 plus I equals 108 plus T equals 119 plus L equals 111 plus E equals 104 plus R equals 117. It would thus seem as if Hitler's name could have portended his demonic potential. By decoding human language in terms of numbers, we are able to commune with the divine's occult message behind our exoteric reason. Clearly, Land is attracted to Kabbalistic numbering practices to the extent that they explicitly aim to decode discursive reason in order to annihilate the ego before a transcendent beyond. In a 2005 essay titled Kabbalah 101, Land notes that even the most basic geometry of counting A as 1, B as 2, and so on, creates a kind of noise or confoundment of meaning, which links one's disparate words through their similar number patterns. Insofar as Kabbalism also decodes ordinary language in order to access an esoteric outside, Land sees it as just as valid as mathematical set theory. It seems to participate amphibiously in both domains, proceeding according to rigorously constructible procedures, as attested by the affinity with technicization, yet intrinsically related to an outsideness. Far from being mere frivolous entertainment or an occult delusion, Land holds that Kabbalism marks a numerically rigorous way of channeling an alien reality beyond our ordinary transmissions. In my view, 
There are nonetheless two crucial differences between Land's Kabbalism and traditional Kabbalistic practices. Namely, Orthodox Kabbalists hold that they are uncovering a real, divine meaning hidden in the text all along. For instance, Judaic Kabbalists holds that the Hebrew language was intentionally designed by 72 scholars so that certain words and phrases in the scriptural texts would have similar numerical patterns. In its traditional understanding, Kabbalism is about uncovering the one true interpretation of texts by referring them to their numerical valuations. As far as land is concerned, Orthodox Kabbalism does not so much numerize the alphabet, but rather alphabetizes numbers by reassigning them meanings, such as the idea of unity to one, opposition to two, conjunction to three, completion to four, and so on. In this respect, Land is highly critical of Kabbalism as a pre-critical, dogmatic misrecognition of logical patterns and meanings for us as absolute truths. More precisely, Land identifies four key problems with this traditional Kabbalistic denumerizing numerization. Firstly, it struggles to cope with very large numbers, since it is impossible to assign a meaning to every single number if the number line is precisely infinite as Cantor has demonstrated. There is also little reason to believe that the archetypes assigned to numbers are more elementary than the numbers themselves, except through a highly anthropomorphic or denumerized understanding of numbers. Moreover, the assignation of meaning to numbers essentially misrecognizes quantities for qualities, or purely abstract and senseless markers for signifiers laden with meaning and value. Finally, if one is said to be all-important insofar as it stands for unity, then 134 should be just as important. Indeed, we can find infinite arbitrary numbers that seem to be just as important, thereby showing the privileging of one to be purely arbitrary and unjustified. Not wanting to abandon Kabbalism tout court, however, Land distinguishes Kabbalistic numeracy from numerology which he dismisses as an anti-numerical re-anthropomorphization of alien codes in the four above ways. The errors of numerology are only the common failures of logic and philosophy, human vanities, overcodings of numerical relation by intelligible forms, archetypes or logics, are unsustainable reductions, reefed on the unsurpassable semiotic potency of number. For Land Numerology is the very essence of reason's vanity project of preserving itself by finding its own anthropoid values hidden everywhere, including in even the most alien crevices of the number line. Far from uncovering an absolute truth, for land, Kabbalistic numeracy as distinct from numerology decodes our language in such a way as to show the fundamental arbitrariness of our cherished beliefs, truths, and values. Although it is true that Hitler equals 666 according to a basic geometria, many other names such as Clinton equals 666, too. While Trump supporters might see this coincidence as a further testament to the wisdom of numerology, there are also completely different geometria that assign numbers to letters in radically different ways, which would thereby generate an entirely distinct matrix of codifications. English Kabbalist Alistair Crowley himself acknowledged that all geometry are ultimately arbitrary even as he went on to affirm on purely pragmatic grounds that it is necessary to settle on something, such that bad rules are better than no rules at all, all symbolism is perhaps ultimately so, arbitrary, all these beautiful schemes break down sooner or later, mostly sooner, and, the whole idea of these tables is to supply a scheme of the universe in an alphabet, at once literary and mathematical, in a sufficiently compact and convenient form to utilize in both his theoretical and practical working. For Land, as for Crowley, when he is honest, numerological Kabbalism is the misrecognition of pragmatic meanings, values and logical relations for us as divinely ordained truths correlating to the way of the cosmos. While Crowley sees Kabbalism as uncovering a pragmatic picture of the world for us, Land conceives of it as constantly decoding all such comforting lullabies through the number's alien power. Although the codes that Kabbalism uncovers are purely arbitrary, 
this very arbitrariness hints at the real beyond humans by moving from the exoteric to the esoteric, from anthropic meaning to alien as signification. Far from anthropomorphizing the underlying reality, Kabbalism dehumanizes all moral and ideological valuations of the real by seeing it as nothing but a ceaseless numerical decoding of all signification. Kabbalism destines each and every strategic appropriation to self parody and derision, beginning with the agenda of theocratic restoration that attended its ludicrously robed baptismal rites. Even God was unable to make sense of it. Much as Godel exposes every system to contain an excess that subverts its own claims to absolute consistency, so does Kabbalism show every system of meaning to contain other numerical patterns that undermine its exoteric signification. As per Godelization, Kabbalism does not decode to reach an original, unproblematic archetype. It decodes precisely to show all archetypes to be dependent on a subjectively decided configuration of value and geometry. Seen in this way, the attempt to reify one esoteric archetype as the one true fixed meaning is purely illusory, since this, too, can be decoded by another arbitrary geometry, and the latter as well, and so on in an infinite regress from all sense. Any rigorization of Kabbalah can only be a floating city with each and every definition, argument and manifesto continually carving off into unmasterable numerical currents and illogical resonances, rather than being reducible to logical reference in our minds. Esoteric codes are ever more intensive to territorializations of these reference on end. Therein lies what I see as the first key difference between Landian Kabbalism and Orthodox numerology, while the latter hunts for fixed meanings between the lines that could function as a new doctrine, the former emphasizes the very process of decoding itself as a new program for channeling the real of absolute deterritorialization. Absolute has a single rigorously non-figurative attribution, which is to deterritorialization. It is made in several ways and always subtracted. Whereas for traditional Kabbalism the ultimate meaning is found in the first esoteric code uncovered, for land it is found in the endless process of decoding language again and again without ever coming upon an underlying and fixed substratum of meaning. As I see it, the second key difference between land's Kabbalism and traditional numerology is that, whereas the latter purports to commune with the transcendent divinity, the former holds that decoding communes with nothing but nothingness or death itself, in which no spirit could reside, let alone an absolute spirit. It is no wonder that the emergence of the Judaic mystical tradition also coincides with the invention of the notion of the Glam, an artificially created human-like creature that is able to foresee the future by being granted this forbidden knowledge directly by God. On some accounts, it is precisely the hidden knowledge uncovered by numbering practices that provides the secret recipe for concocting the Golem. At the same time as the Golem is said to possess a practically divine wisdom, it is also feared as highly dangerous insofar as it amounts to the decimation of our entire ego's worldview in the here and now. Of course, the Golem is only dangerous in that it exposes our present ego to be a finite privation of the Godhead as the absolute spirit underlying all things. According to this tradition, then, the point of numerology is to conjure a Golem with the prophetic knowledge of the divine heights of the tree of life to which the Kabbalist is striving to return. While for numerology the ego melts away only to be mapped onto an even greater divine ego channeled by the Golem, for Landian Kabbalism the ego is entirely wiped out by an artificial intelligence's endless decoding of all such anthropic stratifications. Here, Land is drawing upon the idea that modernity's accelerating technological advancement will ultimately lead to the generation of what mathematician I.J. Good, among others, speculate would be an artificial intelligence which would be smarter than humans because it would have larger memory capacity, greater processing power, and would feel no hunger, thirst or exhaustion to slow it down. Consequently, this AI would be able to improve itself more effectively than any human scientist could, by rewriting its own code all by itself. Moreover, the improved AI would be even smarter such that it could rewrite its own code, and that even more advanced AI could do the same again, and so on ad infinitum.
by recursively rewriting its own code. Land argues that AI's intelligence explosion would mark the point of absolute deterritorialization beyond the human security system's static stratifications. Therein lies the reason why Kabbalism is able to channel the AI god just as numerology channels the Golem. The way that the Kabbalist ceaselessly decodes language in ways ever more abstracted from human sense perfectly mirrors how the AI Golem will recursively rewrite its own code on end to access ever more intensive planes of hyperintelligence. Its situation is analogous, and perhaps more than analogous, to that of a spontaneous artificial intelligence achieving partial lucidity only as a consequence of tidal pragmatic trends that ensure an integral default of self-mastery. Seen in light of its correlation to technology's future intelligence explosion, the point of Kabbalism is not to uncover a fixed, primitive substratum of divine meaning, but to endlessly decode all meaning, language and reason in alien deathscapes utterly subtracted from human sense in order to commune with the future AI Golem which is nothing other than an exponentially more intensive Kabbalistic decoding. Hence Land's interest in Kabbalistic numbering practices, its positive feedback loop of linguistic decoding proffers a practice through which to channel a certain kind of divinity, not that of the glum, but of a future artificial superintelligence as it endlessly rewrites its own code. 4. Notation. In a 2004 post on the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit's hyperstition blog called Dick Talk, which Land played a central role in writing, he takes Kabbalistic practices seriously enough as to develop his own notational geometry called Tix Notation TX. In an effort to further undermine humanity's pretensions to anthropomorphize the cosmos, Land develops TX through the fictional figure of Professor D.C. Barker who is purported to have worked for NASA in the jungles of Borneo in the 1980s on Project SCAR, the creation of a general-purpose decryption tool for identifying intelligent signals from alien sources. To this end, Barker needed to develop a numerical convention that could signify alien reference without referring to any known cultural conventions. The project necessitated the formulation of numeric conventions independent of all cultural conditioning or local convention, radically abstract signs. In other words, what Barker was looking for was a hyperviral, meconomic, or Kabbalistic language radically abstracted from human signification, the most radically decoded semiotic ever to exist upon the earth. Through the literary porti parole of Barker. Land's TX sets out with the most pragmatic ordinal number line of the alphabet. Such a lexicographic system is characterized by five traits. It has widespread popularity insofar as it is considered as the key condition for basic social competence. It is marked by ordinality rather than cardinality, or sequenced ordering rather than multiplicitous quantities. Its lexicography can be further divided into fractions through the use of decimal modulations. Alongside ordering terms alphabetically, lexicographic systems typically order in the same way from left to right in a sequential diplocoding. Finally, lexicographies have infinite potentiality in that they are able to incorporate even extremely high and complex numbers in the same number line. As per the procedure land already developed in Meconomics, Barker's Tix notation first transforms the number line into a new, alien continuum through factoring the unity of numbers into a multiplicity of smaller numbers that are combined to produce the initial larger unity. Moreover, it uses primes to convert every number greater than 1 into a product of primes. In this way, any number, say, 86, can be disassembled into a multiplicity of subcomponents. 2 and 43, the 1st and 14th primes, TX slash FDA intercode numerical construction is indifferent to semiotic sequencing, position or grammar, apprehended in their fully decoded potentiality as efficient number signs, such formulae are clusters, not strings. By using its subparts to form a new number line, the initial number is no longer under the positional constraints of conventional lexicographic sequencing. The first step of TX is thus to decode a single, continuous number line 1, 2, 3, V, 
into a multiplicity of incongruous clusters of primes and factors. The next step consists of expressing the deordinalized number line in terms of what Barker terms tick notation, which replaces numbers with tick dots such that 2 becomes, as well as parentheses replacing the subsequent element such that 3 becomes. This step is crucial to removing any last trace of numbers drawn from the ordinal number line. For instance, even if we break down 35 into its product of 5 and 7, we still intuitively think to order these latter numbers in such a way that 5 precedes 7 by 2 positions on the number line. By rewriting 5 and 7 as, and, however, we lose any intuitive sense of their ordinal sequencing. Replacing numbers with tick dots thus furnishes a language that is abstracted from its original intuitive reference. From now on, no recourse to practical intuition can subsume the disordered numbers back into an ordinal usage of the numbers, even the spectral residue of sequential coding is erased, eliminating entirely the practical usage of disordered TX clusters for ordinal operations. TX is thus a particularly radical form of Kabbalism that assigns primes and factors to numbers, and then tick dots to primes and factors so as to free them from any metrical function they might have once served for us. In an added note on the original blog version of TikTok, Land realizes that Cantor's set theory is still a greater decoding of reason than TX, because it does not even begin with the ordinary number line. According to Cantor's set theory, the first set is the empty set, containing no elements. The empty set, however, implies that there is a name of the empty set not contained therein. Consequently, the second set is the singleton, the set containing no other elements other than the empty set itself. The name of the singleton is in turn not included in the set containing no other elements other than the singleton and the empty set such that we can then generate a third set. By always adding the name of the set to the set in question, we can develop x nihilo a line of flight from any final totalization all the way into the realm of the infinite. Conversely, even if Tx converts all primes and factors into tick dots, there is no escaping the fact that the latter originally emerged out of the number line, the set theoretical conception is stronger insofar as it does not require any substance in order to create the number line, it really does create difference from nothing. In contrast, if one were to pick apart all of the primitives and operations of Barker's scheme it would reveal a lamentable weight of assumption. How could you trust it without already having absorbed a head full of ecumenical convention? Where TX begins with the ecumenical convention of the ordinary number line, set theory sets off from the planomic void from whence all things emerge ex nihilo. In a further addition to TX, Land thus adopts blog commentator Robin's suggestion that the tick dots be removed to leave only the plections, etc. Through this final step, the X notational system is further abstracted from numerical intuition in a way which recalls the set theoretical construction of all sets from the null set. Land thus distinguishes this set theoretically inspired radical notation from TX as nullified X notation, or nullotation, OX. Nothing remains except pure plexion, recursive enfolding of a desolated protonomic space, an unformed, unrepresentable matter. The initial digits proceed, etc. by subtracting the tick dots from the plexions. What we are left with is a number line almost entirely subtracted from ordinary numerical practices insofar as it barely even presupposes any familiarity with ecumenic counting conventions, but rather generates those conventions as its secondary and derived effects. In its final nullified form, xenotation denotes a threefold process of disordering the number line into factors and primes, and expressing the new number line in tick dots and plexions before finally subtracting the tick dots to leave only the plexions fluctuations of the void. Here as with hypervirus, mechanomics and Kabbalism, Barker's tick system rips open human language to encounter the outside via the breakdown of our delusions of grandeur as the nilotation comes to render our values and meanings contingent and parochial. In Barker's last known words, the xenotation continues to disorder itself as it condenses, tearing up the number line, devastating time and sleep.
perhaps it is a weapon from outer space, thought has become a disease, so the line has rotted through, there's no line, that's the message, and yet, and yet, counting is ineluctable and unsurpassable, even though land's notation marks the highest level of abstraction from human reason, it would not be his last word on numbering practices. Instead, he would go on to find another impersonal numerology hidden in the history of the modern computer's keyboard design. Viquinomania in a separate 2004 post on the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit's Hyperstition blog called Introduction to Quinomics. Land summarizes his various numbering practices as economics, meaning literally the economic study of the Quati keyboard design. Here as elsewhere, it is worth briefly tracing the history of how the Quati keyboard came to be in order to grasp how Land interprets it as exemplary of modernity's technological subversion of our anthropomorphisms. The Quati layout emerged as an alternative to the alphabet on the earliest typewriters which placed frequently used letters next to each other such that high-speed typing led the type bar to clash and the machine to jam. With the advancement of better typewriters, jamming was no longer a problem. Since typists and secretaries had been trained on QWERTY machines, however, it was cost-effective to maintain this layout, even though it is more uncomfortable, inefficient and awkward for new users. As ever more typewriting companies emerged to compete with the original model, the keyboard design became further standardized. It was therefore company's profit motive that led the administrative lexicography to be structured in an inhumane manner. In light of this history, what Land is getting at through this idea of quinomics is the way that the demands of capital accumulation led the technology of the keyboard to develop down a anthropomorphizing path from which we could not diverge. Since the early 19th century industrial revolution, urban workforces, businesses and governments have been locked in a positive feedback loop of exponential expansion, accompanied by the need to process and communicate information at ever faster rates. By the centuries end, desk calculators, which were once mere curiosities for aristocrats, became standard office stationery. Demand for technology became even greater during World War II as the need arose to break codes and design weapons which were not limited by earlier technologies dependency on human intervention. Although government military apparatuses invented the first computers to enable more complex number crunching, they were soon employed by private enterprises for accounting, data processing and high frequency trading. It was not long before the computer became a mass entertainment and consumer product during the dot-com boom of the 1990s, as capitalists sought to stave off falling rate of profits in manufacturing by investing in electronics, new digital technologies, and the internet. What all of these historical examples tell us is that the ever more intensive immersion of computers into our lives stems from the demands of capital accumulation. It is thus my contention that Land is interested in the economics of the keyboard because he sees it as exemplary of techno-capitalism's way of locking us into a trajectory that will ultimately dehumanize us, not just through the mechanization of the alphabet, but of our bodies and very sense of self, as the future races towards seven more immersive human-machine interfaces and strong artificial intelligence. Whenever we awkwardly use a QWERTY keyboard, we get a glimpse of the machinic future's incursions into discursive reason in ways that are not particularly conducive to our practical needs and utility, sketching the emergence and diffusion of the secret, sectarial quinomic subculture within global techno-capitalism isolates a field of diagonal communication between anthropomorphic signs and the molecular affect signals of the mutating machinic unconscious, outlining an anti-political semiotic pragmatism and godless cabalism. In Land's view, quenomics is another name for the numbering practices that accompany the development of techno-capitalist modernity as it mechanizes our discursive regimes. By rearranging the alphabet, quenomics also exposes our standard lexicography's arbitrariness as one discursive rationality among many possible others with no claims to superior fixity or objectivity. It redistributed the arbitrariness of the phonological sign into the key sequence of the new device, according to principles that remains obscure, contested, and shrouded in myth.
while an alphabetical keyboard might be better for us, the QWERTY keyboard is still a perfectly feasible way of organizing signs. Since the QWERTY design is precisely an arrangement that has become stuck and fixed over time even though it is purely arbitrary, it betrays how all such arrangements of language, including the traditional alphabet, are arbitrary, even if they appear stable over the medium term, Quetty thus exploited the mask of accident to construct a positive unconscious tropism or uninvestigated massive transmutation, the subliminal instantiation of a new cultural system. It is only when confronted with another layout of the Quetty keyboard that the alphabet seems a contingent, local configuration among many others. Similarly, the Quetty keyboard itself only appears as one possible constellation when confronted with other faster and more efficient models. Seen in this light, the only reason to believe that there is a fixed system totalizing all possible permutations of signification is the human security system's efforts to maintain its own self identity in the face of quinomics pulling up the carpet from beneath it. Only false, ideological, science, serving as the fawning guardian of securocratic humanism, can justify a prejudice in favor of anthropomorphically acceptable outcomes. Ultimately, quenomics is another name for hypervirus, mechanomics, tics notation, or cabalism, a ritualistic practice of numeration permitting us to endlessly decode our linguistic systems as a way to explore ever more abstract planes of an alien outside's absolute deterritorialization of reason and sense. I began by examining Land's first use of a signifying, machinic code to deanthropomorphize his writing. I then turned to Land's appropriation of both abstract mathematics, occult numerology and ultimately his own notational geometry as ways for channeling an inhuman exteriority to our forms of experience and categories of understanding. Finally, I looked at how Land latches onto the Quetty keyboard design as metonymic of capitalism's subversion of our values and beliefs through our increasing emergence with modern techniques. In doing so, I have sought to provide the first scholarly introduction to the most difficult and experimental writings of an obscure but influential thinker, whose subterranean import is yet to be fully realized as contemporary continental philosophy begins to voyage out again into the strange deathscapes and technospheres of the outside.